first Nirvana. This is this this would be really the first Nirvana record because a lot of it was recorded before Bleach. Half of this record, which is out now on Geffen, was part of a demo that was the very first Nirvana recording. They called me up and they didn't have a name. The band had no name. I think they may have been called Pen Cap Chew or uh, Ted, Ed and Fred or something like that. They changed the name every week, I guess is what they told me. And uh, they hadn't really played any shows and they came up and did a, just did a recording with me. They did 10 songs in five hours. We recorded and mixed them, just basically live. Just bam, and it's over with. And then they went home to Aberdeen, which is hundreds of miles from Seattle, and they left me with this tape. And I said, wow, this is really good. I'm going to play this for, for uh, Sub Pop. And I did that, and you know, six months later, Sub Pop eventually listened to it, and, and uh, Jonathan Poneman there decided, uh, okay, Let's, let's put out a single for them, and we did the Love Buzz 7-inch. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, um, this record contains half of that original demo that I did for Nirvana, and it's on here in exactly the same form as we mixed it that day in five hours. There's five songs on here. They're on side two. It's uh, Downer and Beeswax and Mexican Seafood and Hairspray Queen and Aero Zeppelin. And these are the original mixes that we did that day, and they sound awful, you know, and they've got my name on them. You know, and here it is five years later, and I think, well, okay, that's nice that they released it. It's got my name on it, but okay. You know, it says produced by Jack and Dino, too, and I, I really can't say that it's produced. But there's also an outtake from Bleach on here and uh, some singles, and uh, there's some interesting stuff, though. It's good music. Mundo Cão MTV, Mundo Cão MTV, aquele programa primo do lado B que vira e mexe e vem visitar. Dessa vez ele trouxe no bolso uma biografia e o nosso biografado é o produtor e músico de Seattle, Jack Endino. No começo do programa, na primeira parte, a gente falou do começo da carreira dele como produtor e falou da sua banda, Skinhead. Na segunda parte, a gente falou de Nirvana e essa terceira parte a gente dedica às outras bandas, ou pelo menos algumas das outras bandas produzidas por Jack Endino. Você acompanhou o começo do programa, você viu que ele assinou mais de 150 discos. E os 50, dos 50 primeiros discos do selo de Seattle Sub Pop, ele assinou 40, o que não é pouca coisa. A gente vai ver agora mais alguns comentários críticos e vai conversar com o Jack Endino sobre algumas bandas que você conhece, não só do lado B, mas também da programação da sua MTV. A gente vai ver o seguinte, a gente vê o grande Mud Honey, a gente vê Soundgarden, vê Afghan Wigs, Super Suckers e visita também o Mark Lennigan, que é uma grande figura e é o vocalista dos Screaming Trees. Mas o principal de tudo é que a gente conversa e colhe depoimentos sobre essas bandas com o nosso convidado desse Mundo Cão MTV, é o Mr. Jack Endino. My first clients were Green River and Soundgarden. July of 1986, I started working on uh, Screaming Life and uh, Dry as a Bone for Soundgarden and Green River, respectively. Anyway, yeah, the early 70s thing, the, the middle 70s heavy rock was definitely an influence. And uh, people basically borrowed the good parts of it and hopefully left the bad parts, you know, the stupid parts behind. Yeah, I mean, they, they took the good stuff. Like Soundgarden took, like, you know, the good Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin riffs and wrote songs from it. And uh, the thing that these bands are trying to avoid is becoming big jokes like the bands in the 70s became, the big dinosaurs. I mean, you'll notice Soundgarden is not trying, for instance, Soundgarden is not trying to write hit singles. You know, and they don't let the record company tell them what to do. Mudhoney is still recording in basements if they want to. They're not letting Warner Brothers tell them what to do. The bands are hopefully learning from the mistakes of 70s music and maybe taking the good parts of heavy rock and not becoming self-parodies, if you will. You know, at least not unintentional self-parodies. A little bit of on purpose, like Soundgarden will do a Cheech and Chong song because they know it's funny, they know it's stupid. You know, that's the point, is making fun of themselves, you know, rather than trying to be, you know, Led Zeppelin and be, be, be rock gods, you know. It's like anti-rock god. So I hope it continues to be like that. I mean, Soundgarden, for instance, had already made a major label record, and it had done okay, but their, their music is not, as, is, not as, is not as pop. You know, their music is more sort of progressive, heavy rock, and, uh, you know, you don't make hits with that and this is like you know housewives and doctors and lawyers were buying this record you know not just uh, heavy metal kids 
they didn't really get along with each other very well. Yeah, that's you know, they grew up in a small town and they stayed together because they had nothing else to do. But they, I, I mean, I've seen them fight with each other. You know, the Screaming Trees, are, they're famous for having fist fights. Uh, they get along well now, now that their band is actually doing really well. They're all very happy that finally all these years are starting to pay off. Uh, I hear about them a lot because they're my neighbors. They live right near me. And, you know, the drummer in the Screaming Trees was in Skin Yard for two years. Yeah. It was a, a fun record to is record. Is he a difficult guy to work with? I mean, sometimes. Seems to be, yeah. He's very perfectionist. You know, sometimes he'll do a vocal track. You know, he'll sing, and then he'll sing again, and then he'll sing again, and you'll say, no, no, it's perfect. Leave it. But it's fine. He's already drunk you know, a lot. I mean, he's no, no, he doesn't drink in the studio. No, 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 not in the studio. I've never seen him drink in the studio. Oh, good, he's very he serious. Don't have that image about him. Well, he does drink. Uh, yeah, he uh, he has a reputation for drinking. When he drinks, he drinks a lot. But you know, when he's in the studio, he works. He takes his music very seriously, very seriously. All right. <laughs> Quite seriously. So. Uh, no, I had a good time working with him, but sometimes he would be so worried about, you know, it being perfect that, you know, I'd say, no, you've got to keep this. This is great. You're going you're gonna to ruin it if you do it again, you know? And uh, the thing was to try and keep it fresh because he's so perfectionist. Some musicians in the studio are so perfectionist that they'll do something to death until it has no life anymore. They'll be trying to get this perfect take of the vocal or a perfect guitar solo or the perfect drum yeah. track. And by the time it's perfect, it's not that exciting anymore. Yeah, you know, you say, okay, there's no mistakes in it, but there's no spontaneity, okay, yeah. no no life in it anymore. And so the first, the Mark Lanigan record we did, though, was it, it, it went together pretty fast. <laughs> Bands are moving to Seattle to live there because they hear that that's the place to go to get signed. Well, they're right to a certain extent. Uh, one of the first bands to do that was the Super Suckers here. They lived in Arizona, which is, you know, 2,000 miles from Seattle. It's in the desert. There's nothing there in Arizona. They said, hell, let's move to Seattle. And this was, you know, 80, 89. And uh, the first song on here, if I remember right, is a song called Coattail Rider, which is a, it's a very funny song because it's basically they're saying, well, look, you know, all right, we admit it. We were here first, you know. We were from Arizona. We moved here. and we were the last, you know, <laughs> the last band to get signed to Sub Pop before they, they got smart and said, you know, we're not going to sign these. But the Super Suckers, they're just very good guys, yeah, they and they, 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 they were nothing in Seattle. For, yeah, they were, they were nothing in Seattle for two or three years. Nobody wanted to know them, and they just kept going, and finally Sub Pop said, all right, you guys are pretty good. We'll put out a record, you know. And now they're, now they're very, very big in Seattle, and they're a very good band. Jack Engineer, Sub Pop, yeah. Fizeram alguma coisa que não tinha, né? Só acontece de tempo em tempo, é uma coisa um pouco cíclica, a história do rock pode ser uma, uma ideia muito evolucionista, a história do rock. Mas acontece mesmo, tem ali né, um, 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 um cenário mais ou menos saturado e alguém vai lá e fala, né, redescobre a pólvora pela 95ª vez. E ele fez isso, né? Ele fez isso. Então, o, o fenômeno Nirvana não é um fenômeno de mercado, de imposição da mídia. Eu acho bobagem quem fala isso. Né? Que alguma coisa no rock americano estava faltando. Faltava alguém que fizesse isso. Né? Faltava alguém que não fosse porradeira, que não fosse neto, mas que fizesse uma coisa ali que dá para adolescente ter alguma coisa catártica. Né? Que é um pouco. Né? É um pouco que sempre aconteceu na história do rock. Né? Alguém descobre o que faz a libido adolescente ter um, uma explosão ali. Their first record sort of defined grunge rock for, for me and everybody else. Super Fuzz Big Muff, I mean, what else do you need to know after a title like that? Uh, the song Touch Me I'm Sick was actually not on this one. The, the later version of this has their early single on it, which was Touch Me I'm Sick and, and Sweet Young Thing, which was kind of the, the seven inch record that started everything. Uh, they were the original grunge band, and now they're sort of going into a 60s kind of garage rock that's direction. Right, yeah. You know, and, and that's fine. Steve they you know, really kind of music. Yes, yes, he is, he is. He used to be into Blue Cheer, which is a, a late 60s heavy metal sort of crazy band. And now they're, they're sort of going backwards into the Sonics uh, period. And, uh, and I think that's fine. You know, they're doing what they want. Uh, I've always had a, a soft spot for Mudhoney, really. I mean, they're a good band. 